Good evening, Los Angeles, and thank you again for joining me for this evening's briefing on COVID-19 here in Los Angeles. As you can see behind me, we're at our city's emergency operations center once again. And I'm grateful to Aram Sahakian, who is the general manager of our emergency management department for hosting us here today, and for all the work that he and the men and women who work with him every single day, whether it's fires or earthquakes or here during this crisis, do to keep our city safe, ready, resilient, and able to recover from any crisis, no matter how big. This is where we bring together all of our agencies and our departments and all of our partners to coordinate a response during times of crisis. And it's one of the places I love the most because it shows the heart of the city. It shows how hard we work. It shows who we are. It shows the guts and the soul of LA every single day. And it certainly has in this crisis. Today is Workers Memorial Day, a day we remember those who have lost their lives doing jobs that make life better for all of us. Each year, this day is a solemn reminder of the sacrifices that our workers make every single day, and a reminder none of us needs this year. Today, we reaffirm the commitment to everybody who is working hard throughout this crisis, those who deliver our packages, those who stock our shelves, those who provide medical care and keep our hospitals clean, who answer emergency calls and don't think twice before putting their bodies on the line for each one of us. Folks like the 11 medical workers that we learned in the county who have died saving lives during this crisis. We need to take care of those who are taking care of us. I'm joined tonight by one of those people who has been working around the clock. You've met him before in one of our briefings. He is usually the executive director of the busiest container port in the Americas, Gene Soroka. But he's been deputized by me during this crisis to be the chief logistics officer for the city of Los Angeles and to engage in the Logistics Victory LA initiative to procure what we need to keep people safe, to make sure our hospitals, our frontline workers, and everybody who's in a critical industry is safe as can be from the threat of COVID-19. We're gonna hear a little bit more from him in a bit, but I'm glad that you're here again with us tonight, Gene. So we'll get to safety, but first we need to follow the facts. And that's where I'll begin tonight because two numbers starkly summarize where we are as a county and as a country as we passed two notable thresholds today. In America now, there are more than one million diagnosed positive cases of COVID-19. And here in LA County, more difficult even than that, is the 1,000 mark of deaths that we passed today. This was the result of 59 new deaths today, a 6% increase since yesterday, our fourth highest number since we have tracked this. And for comparison, if you average the last seven days, <clears throat> we've averaged about 49 deaths per day. Not just a number, but names, people, lives cut short, folks who we loved and were connected with, members of our family, members of our communities. Across the country today, also another marker, coronavirus has now killed more Americans than died in the Vietnam War. Reported cases, though, in the county were down some from the previous days. And as I mentioned, those previous days numbers were, we believe, a little higher because of new laboratories reporting and dumping that data into the days we saw last week. We saw 597 new confirmed positive cases, bringing the total now to 20,976 confirmed cases in the county, a 3% increase. And again, with that seven-day average, which I always find the most useful, we have a daily average increase of 854 new cases. In the city of LA, those numbers are 308 new cases, bringing the number to 9,697, also a 3.3% increase since yesterday. At our hospitals, we continue to have good and stable and strong numbers. Our general emergency hospitals have 1,179 beds, including 924 acute care beds, and 255 ICU beds available, and an inventory of 1,164 available ventilators. That has helped us keep pace with the hospital admissions, which we track every single day as well. So we're looking to keep folks healthy and safe and out of those hospital beds, and testing, we know, helps us do just that. So individuals with symptoms are still our top priority, 
and you can get a same or next day appointment by going to coronavirus.lacity.org slash testing. There are now, as I mentioned last night, 34 testing locations across LA City and LA County. And today we have the capacity to test a whopping 16,400 people, a number we just two weeks ago would have never imagined. And by the end of today, we will have tested approximately 131,000 people cumulatively through those centers. The tests are very simple and quick. You can do them yourself without getting out of the car. You just cough a few times, you swab the insides of your cheek, the roof of your mouth towards the back, and put the swab into a vial, seal it up, and drop it into a collection bin. It's as easy as that. Testing is available also to critical workers on the front lines without symptoms. So far that has meant first responders, healthcare workers, grocery workers, public transit drivers, and then delivery drivers, rideshare drivers, and taxi drivers began today to be tested, even if they are asymptomatic. And tomorrow we'll go even further, expanding asymptomatic testing, that's testing without symptoms, to all construction workers as well, who many of who have been keeping up with critical infrastructure projects, helping us build housing, and keeping people getting a paycheck in these tough times at a safe distance. We're working with the County Department of Public Health to test residents and workers of our skilled nursing facilities where we know many of the most vulnerable people live and a disproportionate number of our deaths have occurred as a result of COVID-19 with our senior population. To date, we have tested nearly 5,000 residents and staff at skilled nursing facilities across the city. And let me just note one other thing for our seniors. If you applied for our meal program, which we are so excited to expand every single day, know that the city is working to contact you soon. If you're 65 or over, or 60 to 64 with an underlying medical condition, call us. Make sure if you can't prepare meals or you're living on your own, that we can make sure that your needs are met. That number is 213-263-5226. And you can call us between nine and five during the week. If you wanna go online, instead of calling somebody, you can go to coronavirus.lacity dot org slash senior meals to enroll. As I said, we need to protect the people who are protecting us, those doctors, those nurses, support staff at our hospitals, as well as firefighters who are at our testing sites, volunteers who are helping administer those, and police officers responding to calls across the city, as well as our staff at homeless shelters and others. The need is there. We know that. And we know this crisis isn't going away anytime soon until we have a vaccine. People will still be vulnerable. The USC sh study showed us that maybe 96% of us have not gotten coronavirus yet. So we wanna protect people and we wanna protect workers. That's why I appointed the executive director of our Port of Los Angeles, Gene Soroka, as the city's chief logistics officer during this crisis. His incredible experience with supply chains, the contacts that he has in private industry, I knew he would be the right person to find the right things for the right people here in LA. Gene's gonna speak a little bit more about his efforts and our Logistics Victory LA initiative in a moment. But before that, I wanna share a major announcement that he can also give you some details about. The city of Los Angeles has signed an agreement with Honeywell to purchase 24 million N95 masks. We're very excited and I'm so grateful to Gene and his team for I know what has been weeks of negotiations. These masks will meet our American standards. They'll be produced by a factory in the United States and we've all seen the headlines detailing the insufficient supply of N95 masks, the price gouging that's going on that is ridiculous for the prices people have to pay, and the way people have been going from vendor to vendor, buying in several thousand from here and several thousand from there. But by buying in bulk and at a low price point that we're very pleased with, we can see the purchasing power of our city stepping up, not just for our workers here in the city, but for our hospital workers as well. Masks will go to first responders and will be distributed at cost to hospitals in need. The first 100,000 delivered in May, 500,000 arriving by July, and scaling up to 1.2 million per month by November. I'm very grateful to our team, to Honeywell, to our general services department as well for this life-saving purchase agreement, and to my team, including our deputy chief of staff, Matt Zabo and others, and the city council who have worked together to make sure we can spend money quickly when we have deals like this to jump on. So let me turn it over to Gene to detail a little bit more 
And thanks again for ensuring that our people will be safe and that those who are protecting us in our hospitals will be as well. Gene. Thank you, Marin. Very exciting it is. This deal with Honeywell is important on so many levels, but to name three specifically. One, it creates domestic production and jobs only six hours away by the 10 freeway. So while others are clamoring to international markets and trying to get in queues here for domestic stockpiles, we have that ability to bring the cargo here to us within hours. Secondly, the idea here is certainty. With the production schedule that the mayor just laid out, we know exactly how much product we are going to receive at a minimum and when. That in turn will give our first responders, hospitals and frontline medical workers the understanding of how this product is going to come to them and help them in their daily lives. The third piece here is that good price point or the way we want to deliver this and it's going to be at cost to the hospitals and those workers. The structure of this contract is such that we wouldn't have it any other way. And we thought built on the great purchasing capabilities and infrastructure of the city of Los Angeles, we could command that in a way that would give the price point a higher level of importance overall. But delivering these products and what we have seen in the marketplace over the last se several weeks has been quite eye-opening. The burn rates of these N95 masks, of which we just have an example right here, are upwards of 5 million units per month right here in Los Angeles County. If we add in the private sector hospitals and surrounding areas in our region, that number is soon in 10 digit format. So our ability here now to bring on these masks in the schedule that we've just outlined is helpful. It's not gonna complete all the work, but it's a starting point for us. And we'll continue to work to procure more product and get it out there. And that's exactly why Los Angeles created this opportunity through the mayor's vision to have Victory LA in place. And it was to find ways to speed product to market using the great seaport of Los Angeles as well as LAX and our knowledge of the domestic transportation network to make sure we are highlighting and prioritizing these critical shipments to get them to our hospitals. The hospitals have told us they have very little visibility until the last mile of receiving this product. So we've put together a technology platform that coincides with our port optimizer called the Medical Optimizer. And it was simply a plug into our larger port system that can now start with purchase order management to supply development and understand where the gap lies in between. That use of data will make the decision making process that much more quicker so we can get the product directly to market. Some hospitals have told us they need 5 million of these masks just to survive the next couple of months. Others have said their mask usage has grown from 30,000 a month to 300,000. So there still is much more work to do in this area, but it's a great start. And with thanks to Honeywell for stepping up and really working with us, Brent Durham specifically worked around the clock to get this contract done. As we continue down with Love LA, the work on procuring other products is equally as important right now and continues in that fashion. And this will be the nitrile or exam gloves that you see many of our doctors and nurses using, our first responders. The isolation gowns that are necessary for the medical workers as well as the patients who are being examined. And a litany of other products. So we will continue to stay on this course in purchasing products where we do exactly what we set out. We would add value to the hospital community. We're not going to step over a hospital in the order process. We're not going to push them down in the priority level, but we will be complementary in finding alternative sources of production, just like Honeywell, to come to market quicker. And thirdly, we're still working in the area of converting current manufacturing facilities in California that want to enter into the personal protective equipment market. And there are a number of good stories developing right now with folks who have turned over their production lines, hired back their workers, and are getting products to market again, very close proximity, not waiting for overseas shipments. So we have a good play here on trying to have speed to market as well as working our traditional supply chain that we're known so well of at the Port of Los Angeles. Next up is matching supply and demand. And with this tech system I mentioned, it gives hospitals now the opportunity to send demand signals electronically to us. And at the lovela.org platform, we're matching that demand requirement with those suppliers who have been vetted, not only by the Love LA volunteer team that now counts 20 folks 
from downtown LA and our Harbor Department, but also with the best practices used in the General Services Department, as well as the Business Operations Center to make sure that we're checking out everybody we want to do business with very closely, and then we're enabling them to get to work with the needs our hospitals have. In the middle, we're building our LA stockpile. We've commented before that the federal stockpile is non-existent. Unfortunately, the state is so oversubscribed with so many folks looking for help, we decided to go out and do it on our own. So the inventory levels of all these products are starting to build and we're getting them out to the hospitals. Just last week, we brought 4,000 isolation gowns to Pomona Valley Hospital, as well as the folks at St. Francis and Linwood. These were folks that were gonna go out to the store to buy hefty bags cut holes in them so they could go and take care of our medically ill. Now, the 8,000 gowns that we pushed out are not seemingly enough, but again, it's a good start to help get our medical workers in a safe environment so they could help our ill. And I also want to make sure that we thank those who have donated goods. We talked a little bit last week about the great Apple Corporation who brought us 160,000 face shields. Shipping giant from Marseille, CMA CGM, has brought to us three-ply face mask surgical grade. We've also had Operation USA continuing to donate products that we can move out quickly to our hospitals. And next trucking, right here in Gardena, hand-delivered face masks that we also gave to our truck drivers, the Teamsters, and so many others in the Harbor Trucking Association that needed help. So lastly, I just want to again say thank you to the Honeywell Corporation for really coming together in a spirit of teamwork to help out the city when we most needed them. There is much more to do, Mayor. I'm very proud of the traction we've created, but this model of going to, to manufacture and trusted partner as the city of Los Angeles is one that I think we can count on in the future. Thanks so much, Gene. Uh, as always, uh, he impresses me with the work that he does, not just at the port, but here standing this up, and to you and your team, you've really gotten some great victories. These will be lifesavers, quite literally. Um, so thank you to that. And you've heard me say this before, but I want to remind folks that N95 masks are for our medical personnel and some people who have that diagnosis from their doctors for pre-existing conditions. They're also for our first responders, folks that are putting their lives on the line or people who already have pre-existing conditions that put their lives on the line. So please do not get medical grade N95 masks. You see these selling for seven, eight, twelve, thirteen dollars because of that. Um, we must not contribute to that shortage, and we must help all of our medical personnel and first responders to be safe. The non-medical face coverings that you should wear in public can be bandanas, they can be scarves, they can be made for, from other items. I got my Eric Garcetti commemorative one sent to me by ProMC. Thank you for that. We've got so many folks that are making them and putting people back to work here today. So I encourage everybody to be creative. Again, share your ideas about what you're wearing um, and use the hashtag LA Protects to share with the entire community. And that hashtag name aligns with our LA Protects initiative, which is producing non-medical masks that are designed for our grocery store workers, our non-medical staff in hospitals, and others who are providing essential services during this crisis. We've seen a huge surge of interest from our garment and apparel industry. Today, more than 1,280 companies have signed up saying they are ready to make these masks. And 433 have already been approved, and uh, that's to meet the needs of nearly 2,000 essential businesses that have requested more than 1.7 million non-medical masks. My team has sent these businesses a database of LA Protects manufacturers so they can source them here locally. We love the idea of buying things here keeping it American, doing what we can to make sure that we put people back to work in our backyard. And companies like Spectrum, who ordered 150,000 facial coverings for their technicians across the country. That means that 64,000 workers who visit an average of five homes a day are protecting themselves and their customers. Um, and I'm proud Los Angeles is stepping to, up to manufacture this, not just for ourselves, but for the entire nation. So we're here to support you. If you're a business in need, large, medium, or small, please go to coronavirus.lacity.com slash LAProtects to find out more. Now, I hear folks ask why we don't expand this initiative to help folks that don't have the means to get masks, and we did just that. It was actually a suggestion from someone, what about folks who have no place to go, who are experiencing homelessness? And tonight I can report that on Skid Row, we've distributed 65,000 non-medical masks to unhoused Angelinos, outreach workers, and folks on the front line working to protect and to save lives. So LA Protects is, is doing much more 
than producing just non-medical masks. We have a partnership with the Los Angeles chapter of the American Institute of Architects to take a 3D printing model for PPE that was developed at USC that I visited in the lab and other local universities and design, design schools and to expand that. One company in the San Fernando Valley that I've mentioned, Wet Design, is producing now a face shield every 15 seconds. Next week, they'll have one produced every three seconds. It's showing the ingenuity and the creativity of Los Angeles, the creative and manufacturing capital of America. And that's just one firm. So far, we've had 90 other firms that are volunteering to support the production of PPE-like face shields for hospitals. And the city continues to serve as this bridge between the needs of our frontline workers and medical personnel and the central businesses that can produce this equipment, as well for other businesses as we prepare for getting people back to work in the future. Workers at LA Protects manufacturing sites must be safe and fairly paid. Uh, we had questions a couple nights ago, and as I mentioned each evening, that's why we've launched an LA Protects Business Ambassador Program to visit the sites of those. So far, we visited 202 visits, making sure that distance, distancing protocol is complete, making sure that there's disinfection, the work citations are correct, the people are paying their employees the right amounts. So you see the beating heart of LA Protects is about bringing the best of us all together, our creativity, our ethics, our can-do spirit, our hard work to help ourselves and to help others to protect lives and livelihoods. But we can't forget how many folks are struggling right now, deeply struggling. How many workers have lost jobs, seen hours cut, we're wondering what comes next and how much worse is it going to get. We're doing everything possible in our power to relieve the situation for those Angelinos. And more help began to arrive from the federal government two weeks ago when families began to receive their economic impact payments as part of the recent CARES Act, what I've called the economic survival package. But there's a catch. Unfortunately, too many Americans and certainly too many Angelinos don't have a bank account. That means they can't get a direct deposit of the money that they're entitled to, and it's taking too long to receive payments that they deserve and that they need right now. This speaks to a painful and unjust reality at the heart of our economic system that predates this current price crisis. People who don't have much to begin with also sometimes lack the resources and the access to get ahead. In this case, folks who are considered unbanked are being unfairly penalized. So we're partnering together with the county's Department of Consumer and Business Affairs and the Bank on LA County initiative led by the Center for Financial Empowerment to help connect households to resources on safe and affordable banking options. Our immediate purpose is to connect you, if you don't have a bank account, with those economic impact payments that are coming to you from the federal government. You need that money and you need it quickly. But this can also, if you're unbanked, give you a long-term benefit too, enabling more workers to connect to a financial system in a way that doesn't take advantage of them, with payday lenders, with loans, with things that people who hide their money in their mattress or go to a neighborhood check cashing place unfortunately have to deal with. So you can open up your own affordable bank or credit union account online now to claim your stimulus money faster. Go, as always, to coronavirus.lacity.org slash banking to do this right now. For those of you who are having difficulty uh, opening an account or cashing your checks, you can find a list of partners on our site who will cash your stimulus check at no cost. And I'm proud to say that Bank of America, Chase, and Union Bank are the first to announce that they will waive the cashing fee for non-account holders. Thank you. And while we're making it easier to bring federal dollars to local families, there's also a lot more support to anybody who has lost a job. Thanks to the CARES Act, the state and the federal governments have expanded and extended unemployment benefits for the millions of workers who have been directly impacted by a COVID-19 crisis. And I want to highlight some important changes there because we've all been reading and experiencing how difficult it can be to access some of those dollars. But for the first time, the self-employed, independent contractors, part-time and so-called gig workers who usually don't qualify for these payments can apply for unemployment insurance. That's really vital to us here in Los Angeles and across California, where we have a robust, thriving community of artists, writers, musicians, filmmakers, rideshare drivers, and more who don't fit neatly into the normal ranks of our workforce. And these benefits now include an additional $600 per week 
beyond the usual state allocations, and they're retroactive to the date you lost your job, not just the date you first file for unemployment. These small but critical shifts are meant to ease the burden uh, just a little bit on those who have been hit hardest by this pandemic. And we know those waits are long. We know the state is working on making those easier. But go to edd.ca.gov for more information. I truly believe that this crisis and this period has brought out the best in us. Every day in this crisis, I've been moved by the heroes among us, the people among us, in moments of darkness who are illuminating our city of angels. The philanthropists, the first responders, the volunteers, the workers, and today, as I mentioned when I started, on Workers' Memorial Day, we honor those heroes who have been taken from us by COVID-19. Cecilia, a nurse at Hollywood Presbyterian who devoted her life to caring for the sick. Anthony and Elihil, caregivers at the Filipino Worker Center in Westlake, who supported Angelinos with disabilities living in long-term care. Emmanuel, an electrician at UCLA Health in Westwood who helped build our structures and worked every day to power our city. These are fallen angels here in our city of angels, but we remember you. We lift you up. On this Workers' Memorial Day, we thank you and your families for what you gave to us. And every single day, we know that your memory is something that will light us in the path forward. We honor every worker who has died in this past year serving people and making our lives better. We honor their memory and their legacy of service by committing ourselves to their unfinished work, by caring for people around us and reminding one another that we're in this together. And I know that we have it in us and our mandate is clear. So let's stay safe and let's stay healthy and let's stay at home. Strength and love, Los Angeles. With that, as always, be happy to take questions from the press. Thank you. First question, please. I'll take the first question. Our first question will come from the line of Mary Beth McDade, KTL Channel 5 News. Please go ahead. Hi, Mary Beth. Great. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Nice to speak with you again tonight. You um, so just uh, this kind of goes with the N95 masks. Uh, great news about uh, getting a, a big shipment in. I know that's uh, been a real concern. And with that, I'm also wondering uh, if any hospitals or other frontline worker facilities in L.A., if they've been using the, those cleaning sites that have been set up by FEMA, by Burbank Airport. My understanding is it's a free service. It's military-grade cleaning, and they can clean for free 320,000 masks per day. I mean, it just sounds like that would be a great uh, outlet to use to help with this shortage of N95 masks. Yeah, I, I don't have the latest information. Maybe Gene does, and I know the sheriffs are also standing up some of those disinfectant uh, machines that can help recycle those existing ones. And I know hospitals have been trying to do some of those things on site because um, we, we did not set those up directly, but we hope they are. We're going to have to do all of the above. Procure more masks, well, reuse them. Something different. Yeah, yeah, it was a different technology, the sheriff one that they had, but those two things will help us boost the number. But I don't know, Gene, if you know anything about that, if, if not. Yeah, I do, yeah. and, and you're exactly right, Mayor. We're going to have to use all of the above to meet the needs of our frontline medical workers. Um, the cleaning machines can work on an individual mask several times before it must be discarded. And please remember that these masks were designed to be one use at a time. But the technology is moving forward. We're in contact with these companies and working on some unique solutions. But getting the inventory here into lo greater Los Angeles is still of primary importance to our hospitals. Thanks, Mary Beth. Appreciate it. Next question, please. Our next question will come from the line of Dakota Smith. Please, oh. or sorry, Dakota Smith with LA Times. Please hey, Dakota. Go Good evening. Hi, good evening. I, I had a question for Jean about the logistics fund in terms of, um, first off, maybe I missed this. What is the overall price of the Honeywell mass? What is the city um, front loading? What does that cost? And then secondly, the city of L.A. moved $20 million over to the logistics fund to buy PPE. Can Jean explain so far what the city has bought with that money and which companies um, are buying that, uh, the good so far. Thank you. Sure. On the uh, Honeywell mass, they are being sold to us at 79 cents plus tax per unit. 
and that is exactly what we will be pushing towards the hospitals to purchase those masks from us at cost. And this is a designation between Honeywell and the city of Los Angeles. We are not putting money up front. We are paying for the masks as they come off the production line with that schedule that the mayor outlined earlier, created by victory purchase orders that initiate that production in Phoenix. To date, we've gotten a number of donations, Dakota, as I recounted to you, 160,000 masks from Apple, Operation USA has brought in gloves and ISO gowns and a couple of other products. CMA has some masks on the way, as did uh, Next Trucking. And we also, through the work here at the backbone of the city's procurement process with the General Services Department, Tony Royster and John Trevgoda have purchased approximately a half a million three-ply medical grade masks that will be pushed out in inventory to those hospitals who need as well. Uh, we saw your note and we'll be sending you a full list as you had required of us to make sure that you can keep up with what's being purchased and move directly to our frontline medical workers. And we'll make that available to anybody from the media who'd like to see that. Please just let us know. Thanks, Dakota. Next question, please. Our next question will come from the line of Alex Michelson, Fox 11 News. Please go ahead. Hey, Alex. Hi, Mayor. Um, I'm wondering what your reaction is to Governor Newsom's briefing today, and specifically on the issue of schools. A lot of people were surprised by that uh, thought that we might have schools come back in July or August. Do you agree with that? Do you think we're ready for that? And what could schools look like if they did, in fact, come back in July or August? So I, I thought it was a great briefing today from the governor, as always, some really good um, frameworks for understanding the reopening. I'm on the phone each evening with mayors from around the state, country, and sometimes world, looking at those best practices. One of the things we've looked very closely at, of course, is our schools. And while we don't have direct authority uh, from the city government over the schools, we've certainly been in close consultation. But there's independent schools, there's the school districts of LA County. Um, and I do think that it is possible, absolutely. We've looked, for instance, at Denmark, uh, one of the first places to reopen schools. How do you do uh, the spatial distancing that we need to have to keep our students safe? Um, some have suggested you could do this in shifts so that kids would go to school for four days a week, half of the class, and maybe three days a week for the other half, and work on schedules that would work uh, throughout the week but not overwhelm uh, the spacing requirements that we would have. I think we're going to have to get really creative. I know there's a lot of young people who would love to go back to school. Usually, you can't wait for the summer, and you want the summer to last forever. I think for a lot of young people that have been indoors for a long time, they miss their friends, they miss their teachers, they miss their campuses. And so I know that LAUSD is doing a lot of hard work right now thinking about how to pace that in, or whether that be in the fall. But that won't be something that I think the governor mandates. I think that'll be district by district. And we're certainly open to listening to LAUSD, assisting them in whatever ways they need to feel that they can safely open. But I'll go back to what I said last night. The three things are the need, what's the risk, and what safety measures can we add. The need to educate our children and to have them be in a safe place so that parents can return to work when we get those orders, that's really important. So I think it's very high need. The risk, though, is mixed. Substantial risk when you have people in congregate settings but young people have generally had less risk. But remember, there are young people with pre-existing conditions. They need to be educated as well, and we need to accommodate them. In terms of the safety measures, I do believe that there are ways that we can still educate our children, space them out more. I think the older the children are, the more they would adhere to that. With younger children, there's going to be some additional difficulties. But to me, it's the same thing as a workplace. We need temperatures going in, temperatures going out. You need to quickly be able to find people who seem like they're symptomatic, and or if we can get testing for those children, that to me would be the most important thing, regular testing. And I hope as we keep expanding our testing that soon we'll be able to go to asymptomatic people throughout the county one day, and that would include our children. And if they can get those sort of tests, I think that would give us a lot of confidence about reopening schools sometime in the fall, um, or if people have a rush back to catch up even in the summer. Thanks, Alex. Next question, please. Our next question will come from the line of Claudia Prosciutto with KNX News Radio. Please go ahead. Hi, Claudia. Hi, uh, Dakota. Actually, asked some of the questions that okay. I had, but uh, I also wanted to find out what groups you're uh, considering opening testing up to next, 
And also, uh, at last check, you had said that two city employees had died, and I'm wondering if, you can, if that's still the case, if it's two, and if you can provide any further details about that, sure. the impact on the city workforce. Thank you. Thank you. No, thankfully, it's still just been uh, two city workers um, with our, our, our housing authority, um, which is connected to the city um, and the city oversees. Um, no more details than that out of respect to the families, and uh, I'll leave that up to them if that's something that they want to talk about in the future. Uh, but we mourn them, well-loved, beloved uh, members of our city family, but thankfully uh, none since. Uh, the next people to expand will be construction workers. That goes live tomorrow morning where folks who work in the construction trade can sign up. Um, you know, there's not like some secret list, but every single day we look at expanding. My goal, as I mentioned, is to stop even worrying about what classification. I hope that in the coming weeks, we can open up asymptomatic testing to all Angelinos. Certainly the states stepping up to help with, as they mentioned today, over 80 testing centers throughout California. Uh, and we learned some plans of about maybe seven of them to be here in LA County. That will help. We wanna make sure they're coordinated together so people don't get confused about how you make an appointment between city and county tests and or state tests. So we're gonna work that out with them. But I do think we need to probably be somewhere about triple where we are daily in testing in general for us to have the confidence for some of the reopening steps that we have. The governor set some very bold goals on that testing. We continue to expand faster than we expect. And so that gives me a, a lot of reassurance that we can get to a testing place where everyday folks who are asymptomatic but potentially in some of the first groups of people that could return to work and or school can get those tests that they need to have the reassurance for themselves and for their coworkers or classmates uh, that they aren't infectious even if they don't have symptoms because we know there is a strong percentage of people who are completely asymptomatic but who are contagious those can be the most dangerous spreaders of all so uh, hold tight but it's construction it, today was rideshare drivers taxi drivers tomorrow's construction workers every day we're adding more and more people who are asymptomatic and a reminder anybody with symptoms can today go to one of those testing centers so Go to coronavirus.lacity.org slash testing and sign up now. Thanks. Next question. Our next question will come from the line of Elizabeth Chu. Please go ahead with LA Daily News. Good evening, Liz. Go ahead. Mayor of the, uh, New York City yesterday um, put out um, a call uh, for uh, to hire contact tracers. A thousand of them. Um, I was wondering if you think that that's something that should be done here in Los Angeles and when that might happen, if it, it is something. And I also was wondering about the uh, the different types of swab tests. I guess um, apparently the testing sites that um, city and county have set up are mouth swab tests. And it, are you concerned that they, they may have um, false negatives? Um, and uh, I was also wondering if. Uh, if you might be able to explain the other types of tests available to maybe nursing homes and uh, homeless shelters are going to be, or, or I guess the pop-up sites, are they going to be mouth swab tests or nasal swab tests? Um, can I get some clarity on that? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Let me start with the first one. Uh, absolutely. Actually, I have a, an op-ed piece I wrote in on CNN together with the mayor of Oklahoma City, a bipartisan call together with Dr. Scott McClellan, who used to head up the FDA and was involved at CDC, calling on a national CARES Corps. And we're working together with uh, a group of senators now at the national level, level led by Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, uh, and looking for, again, building this bipartisan uh, coalition behind a CARES Corps. Think about the Peace Corps in the Cold War. Think about the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Depression. But we have an estimate that 300,000 people will need to be enlisted across the country to help with testing, with tracking and tracing as well. We've seen great models, whether it's librarians up in San Francisco, whether it's in Boston, where uh, um, I think it's partners in health are training out of work Bostonians to be uh, these contract tra uh, contact tracers and to assist public health departments. We absolutely need it here. And so I've discussed this with Dr. Ferrer. I said we have a lot of city employees under our disaster service workers program. We could move over to do that. But there is no question, and this is very important for everybody listening, it isn't just about the number of tests. As important or even more important, especially when so many of us are vulnerable, it's going to be finding those cases quickly and then tracking and tracing. Those are two different things. One is tracking people who are symptomatic to make sure that they are staying home. 
but also tracing who they came into contact with and letting them know they've been in contact with somebody who is now COVID-19 positive and that they need to quarantine themselves and also report what their symptoms are. That is going to be one of the most valuable weapons for us opening things up and keeping them open. The longer it takes, and the standard is really 24 hours to find those folks, but if it takes us days upon days because we don't have enough people, we will see many people get sick, we will see uh, infections accelerate, and we'll have to close the door to some of the openings that we had. So we can't do this quick enough. Last point, I've also talked to the state about this. Um, Josh Friday, who's the uh, chief service officer for the state of California, for Governor Newsom, um, others about a California CARES Corps that we could look across the state at enlisting people. But the national model would build on AmeriCorps, would give people a stipend, would pay them at the national level, but they'd work at the local level. And I think that as a brilliant model, and I'm going to be putting a lot of my weight and fellow mayor's weight behind that. In terms of the tests, no, I don't. There's no tests that are perfect, um, but I have strong confidence, same test that the Air Force uses. Um, you know, we're getting good and accurate readings on that. Um, a lot of FDA tests are permitted, but not quote unquote approved, because usually FDA tests take a long time. But we look at who else is doing it. The Air Force, I trust, it's the same test there. But it's a good point. There are other tests that we're using, Everly Well and others, UPS, some of the ones that we're doing that allow us to do the nasal swab. So we do have a combination. There was just no way that there was enough of the nasal swab ones available, and this was a great, innovative way to get there. I've actually read a lot of the studies that show the error rate on nasal swabs, the error rate on the, um, on the cheek swabs, um, and they're very similar. Um, so you're always going to get some false negatives, some false positives, but there is no question that ramping up in the way that we did with what was available has saved lives and we're very confident in that moving forward. Um, I think you had a third question, but I, th um, I think that's it. I got them all three. Okay, thanks Liz, appreciate it. Next question. I'll take the next question, thanks. Our next question will come from the line of Tina Jenkins Bell with shareable.net. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Hi. Good evening, Mayor. Hi. You might have to mute what your computer. What housing options are available for people who are What housing options are available for people who are homeless? Um, okay. A number of housing insecure during uh -huh. the coronavirus. Um, I'm interested in housing solutions during and beyond the pandemic. Absolutely. As am I. It's a great, great question. So first and foremost, that we've stood up uh, first congregate shelters um, that we did through our rec and parks facilities and our rec centers. To give you an idea of the scale of that, we were building over an 18-month period before COVID-19 occurred the fastest pace of new shelters in the country. Uh, these were 2,200 beds over 18 months. Um, we now have over 1,000 beds we've stood up in just a matter of weeks. Add to that the hotels and motels that we've stood up. We've done about 2,000 beds already in about six weeks as it compared to 18 months. Um, there are two types of shelters in terms of the motel and hotel rooms that are available. One is called Tier 1. That's available to folks who are vulnerable but not yet sick. So people experiencing homelessness, people who have pre-existing conditions, people who don't have a place to go when a family member is sick but they know that they have a condition that makes them susceptible. Those hotels for free are available. I'll give you the, the latest numbers on those. Uh, there's about 1,412 operational rooms. I think we're about to sign something that may uh, close to double that. And over 1,100 of those rooms are occupied now by 1,238 people. Um, the tier two hotel and motel rooms are for folks that already got sick. And we don't just have the shelters. We also have taken in hundreds uh, of um, campers that we are, have in our rec centers at the VA and other places for people who need to isolate or who need um, a different sort of uh, uh, space than a congregate shelter or a hotel room. Um, the hotel rooms, though, that are Tier 2 right now, there is 419 operational rooms. They're about 72% occupied, so there's rooms available just as we speak if somebody does contract COVID-19 and is positive and needs to isolate as well. Um, our goal is to get thousands more through Project Room Key. This is a partnership between the cities of LA County, LA County, and the state. Uh, secondly, FEMA for the first time in their history, and I said two years ago we needed a FEMA level response to homelessness, st uh, stepped up and finally said for the first time in any American emergency, 
you can get reimbursed and house people before the disaster hits them. So somebody who's asymptomatic can actually get into housing simply because of how vulnerable they are. Uh, to folks who are housing insecure, uh, those uh, spaces in the Tier 1 hotels are available and those spaces in the Tier 2 hotels are also available to them. Uh, many people who, as I mentioned, don't have a place where they can self-isolate or their family member if they get sick or they're exposed to somebody who's sick. So we're going to keep building that. The second part of your question was, what are we going to do long term? I'm so glad you asked that because we've been putting a lot of time into this. I'm going to be on a call tonight with community leaders and business leaders on this. Shame on all of us. If we let people come in and then when this crisis is over, they just go back out on the street. So we convened a call with the 36 cities today uh, that were given direct money under the CARES Act for COVID-19 expenses and the Treasury Department. And one of the things we asked is, can we invest in things that keep people housed long term? And it looks like probably six months after the end of this year, we can still spend that money on keeping people housed. That should hopefully give us enough time to work on solutions for all of them, to get into apartments, to get into permanent housing. As we build the HHH thousands of units passed by the voters that are opening, I think we have 3,000 units opening between this year and breaking ground this year. So we've got thousands coming online. We can move some of the toughest cases and the highest need into those as well. And then lastly, we're working on what we can do to keep people housed. So we're talking with the council. You've seen many of their motions as well as my executive orders to make sure that people don't get evicted now, but also that they have eviction defense afterwards, legal counsel that can help them, um, rental assistance over 12 months to be able to make sure they don't become homeless. So we're looking at a whole package, seeing what we can use federal dollars for. And I've, I've lastly supported at the federal level, uh, federal legislation that would give money to tenants and to landlords to make sure people can stay in their housing. This is absolutely critical uh, to help those mom and pop landlords and to help renters who right now cannot pay the rent. So I support that legislation officially. The city council has supported it. I've signed on and we're building a coalition of mayors around the country to support that legislation and hopefully the next CARES Act coming soon. Thanks so much for those questions. Next question, please. Our next question will come from the line of Eric Hines with City News Service. Please go ahead. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Hello, man. Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that I heard you correctly. Um, what is going to be the cost to hospitals for the N95 masks that are coming in? And uh, I also wanted to know if that cost would be uh, reimbursable from the federal government. Could you just shed light on uh, that real quick? We hope it will be reimbursable. We're going to sell at cost, and it's 79 cents per mask. These masks... As I mentioned, we're seeing them go for $7 imported from other places, $12, $13 in some cases. 79 cents will be the cost. It meets the N95 highest standard. It's manufactured in the United States, and we're going to pass it on at cost to hospitals. We won't make a single buck, and we'll take care of whatever cost of getting them that we have. Um, as you noticed, Gene said, plus tax. And I do hope as the legislature comes back in session, it would be a wonderful thing for the legislature to say we don't have to pay sales tax on items like this. And in states that are manufacturing this, I think that would be a great national way to help us all out. But we'll see. So it's 79 cents plus tax, uh, sales tax, and it will be passed on at cost. Thanks, Eric. Next question, please. And our last question from the night is in Spanish, and it comes from Abel Alamilo, Telemundo 52. Please go ahead. Buenas tardes. Good evening, Alex. Hi, Mayor. Uh, earlier today, Governor Newsom outlined a four-phase approach to opening businesses in the state. How does this approach mirror or differ from your plan to reopen businesses in Los Angeles? So I know this is going to get confusing because we're going to have national advice. We're going to have state advice. Hopefully here locally, at least we'll have county and city advice together. And we've had a marvelous partnership between the county of Los Angeles and the cities of LA County, uh, led by Catherine Barger, led by Dr. Freer, led by Dr. Galley and others. They will advise, obviously, the order at the county level. A lot of us are coordinating to make sure cities and counties move together. But I thought the governor's um, framework was a very complimentary and useful one. Um, it, we said here in Los Angeles the things that we're looking for and besides frameworks, one of the things that I want to emphasize tonight is we're also going to listen to those workers and industries themselves who suggest how they can reopen safely. 
I know that a shopkeeper, that she cares deeply about her customers. And so when she's working with a group of other shopkeepers about how we could open up clothing stores or something, um, they're definitely going to give that thinking about how do they get uh, thermometers, how many people um, in how much space, how long can they be there, et cetera. So we're listening to a lot of these industries and setting up 12 different sector groups, as is the county, and we're doing that in conjunction. So uh, Kevin McCowan, who works at the county, emergency operations together with Chief Moore, who you heard from last night, I believe, or two nights ago, um, are coordinating to make sure that the city and county can move on these things together. But I thought the governor's framework was good. Remember, there's really three things that we need to have. We need to know what we need to measure and what those triggers are. So let's measure how many people are coming to a hospital day. Let's measure how many tests we're doing. And then let's have a number, and I hope the state can help us with this guidance. This is something I talked to the 13 mayors of the big cities uh, with last night, is tell us, you know, what is the measure by which we should be opening? And what is a measure by which we say, uh-oh, things look like they're getting bad early. Let's close down a little bit. Um, and then lastly is that piece of what we can do in each one of these spaces, industries, schools, to accommodate things more safely. So you have to build up, I think, those three things and then get to the specifics of manufacturing, the specifics of retail, the specifics of churches and synagogues and places of worship, the specifics of schools as well. But that work can't happen quickly enough. Uh, in the meantime, we do still have a couple of weeks of this order. I remind people uh, May 15th is not a day that suddenly uh, the light switch goes on, uh, the doors all open, and everybody's running around the city. That would be dangerous. That would kill people. That's the first day which we are thinking about doing those modifications, but that will be in consultation with the county, and they will be baby steps at first. Those baby steps, when they go well, will be rewarded by further and bigger steps, and so on. And where we see, as we know it will happen, not just because of the decisions we make, but because the life of a virus will, will ebb and flow, we may need to do this again at different points. I hope we're better prepared as a nation. I know we will be as a city, and I certainly know that we will be as a people ready and that we'll understand the importance of those moments of going indoors to save lives. We've seen the success in bending the curve. Let's flatten that out and let's do that successfully. In Espanol también, I'll switch to Spanish real quick uh, for that question. Um, es, es muy importante en estos próximos días a tener una estrategia juntos con el gobernador y a nivel estatal, a nivel federal y aquí en el condado de Los Ángeles con las ciudades del condado de Los Ángeles. La ciudad de Los Ángeles es la ciudad más grande en el condado, pero hay 87 otras ciudades también. Y tenemos uh, muchas llamadas con los supervisadores, con los oficiales como doctora Ferrer, uh, y estamos planeando uh, la, uh, un abierto uh, de la apertura en el futuro. Pero necesitamos más pruebas, necesitamos más información de las industrias específicas en Los Ángeles. Uh, es diferente en diferentes partes de Los Ángeles. Y necesitamos las medidas que pueden uh, dar a nosotros la información muy crítica. Por ejemplo, hay días cuando hay más casos y estos casos están aumentando muy rápidamente. Necesitamos a, a cerrar un poco de la apertura. Otros días es ok y nosotros podemos expandir uh, la, las libertades um, en Los Ángeles, la, las industrias que están abiertas, las escuelas y campuses también. Este es la, el sistema, pero el sistema del gobernador Newsom es muy bueno. Uh, yo estoy leyendo no solamente sus planes, pero planes de otros estados, otros países, otros, um, otras ciudades en los Estados Unidos y en el mundo. Y espero que nosotros podemos tomar estos pasos juntos. Porque cuando un condado uh, mueve en esta dirección y otro condado mueve en otra dirección, no tendremos éxito, uh, como uh, por ejemplo con las playas este fin de semana en el cond los condados de Ventura y uh, de Orange. Uh, es muy importante a tener estas acciones juntos y es mi esperanza que nosotros podemos tener estos pasos juntos. Gracias. With that, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank again Gene Soroka, get him back to work. Remember, uh, don't take those N95 masks 
use yours unless you are one of those critical workers. To all of our doctors, our nurses, this is a great day for you to make some noise at 8 o'clock again, out your window, out your door, applaud um, for those who are close to a hospital, scream loud enough so they can hear you, especially on this Workers' Memorial Day where we know already in this county that our medical workers have given their lives to keep these numbers low, to make sure that we continue to move forward with bending the curve. And God bless everybody who's working hard to make sure Los Angeles is safe. Thank you all so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Comunico con ustedes desde nuestro centro de operaciones de emergencia, donde se unen nuestros departamentos y agencias